Welcome back to Movie Mo Show. Today we are going to review the coming of age drama, Invictus. If you like our content, don't forget to like and subscribe. We post multiple times daily. Spoilers ahead. Nelson Mandela's 1990 release from prison serves as the film's opening scene, Morgan Freeman. Mandela's release also heralds the beginning of the end of apartheid in South Africa after he spent nearly 26 years on Robben Island as a result of plans to sabotage the South African government. Mandela easily prevails in a new election. He delivers a speech as part of his oath promising to bring the South African people together. The majority of the black tribes, the largest of which are Zulu, Kosa, and Bapiti, and the Afrikaners, white South Africans who immigrated from Europe during the 17th century, have been split by the current racial division. A large portion of South Africa's black population celebrates Mandela's win, while the white Afrikaner and Zulu populations start to fear for their survival. A group of cars pulling Mandela down the road provides a striking contrast to the underprivileged black children playing soccer on one side and the white Afrikaners playing rugby on the other. The Springboks head coach reminds his troops to keep this day in mind since it's the day the country went to the dogs. Jason Shabalala, the chief of security for Mandela, Tony Kuroj, asks Mandela for something regarding the squad. In order to protect the president, he requests extra employees, the present squad is made up of four people of color. In retaliation, Mandela employs four former white special branch agents under the direction of Eddie N. Fighter, Julian Lewis-Jones. They clash when they first meet because of pervasive racial issues, but are forced to resolve them. Shabalala warns his black co-workers, in particular Linga Munsami, Patrick Mofakang, that while they are working together, they would observe the whites attentively because he has no alternative but to work alongside them. The tension during his first days in office is obvious because the majority of the former president's subordinates, most of whom are Afrikaners, retain their positions. They start collecting their possessions in anticipation of what they believe to be an impending dismissal from Mandela, fearful that he will fire them. When Mandela notices this, he calls a meeting and delivers an impromptu speech in which he tells his workers that he won't fire any former members of the old administration and that they must cooperate to advance racial equality in South Africa. There are no dissenters and the speech is warmly received. Soon after, Mandela starts going on early morning walks with two security officers. Mandela is approached by a blue vehicle that is speeding and making erratic maneuvers as it travels through the streets. Even though security suspects an assault, it's just a man delivering newspapers. The South African Springboks rugby team, which is mostly made up of white people with the exception of one black player named Chester who will miss the future matches owing to a hamstring injury, is soon introduced to us. Francois Pinar, Matt Damon, is the team's current captain. Many black South Africans refuse to support the Springboks when they play the Springboks because they believe that the name, logo, and colors of the team are symbols of apartheid's dark past and alleged racial injustice. Instead, they cheer for England. The Springboks had more losses than victories with less than a year till the 1995 Rugby World Cup, which South Africa is hosting. It is widely expected that they will lose to Australia early in the competition. Mandela starts to consider how he's going to bring South Africa together and set aside their differences after reading that the Springboks coach has been sacked, with Captain Francois still in place, and he sees rugby as the means to accomplish so. Mandela hopes to bring Afrikaners together by maintaining the Springbok name, against the Sports Commission's unanimous vote to change the team name to the Proteus, and by using the approaching World Cup as an example of how to move past South Africa's apartheid past. This is because most Afrikaners fear losing their sense of identity. Mandela personally flies to the commission to persuade it to reconsider, arguing that by maintaining their prior logo and name, they may continue to connect with Afrikaners, who think Mandela is trying to drive them out of South Africa. The commission doesn't take kindly to this, and by the time Mandela departs, his plan has only received 13 votes. Even so, he considers this to be progress because he was able to maintain the Springbok's name with just those votes. While some in the administration agree with him, his assistant Brenda Mazibuko, Adjua Ando, disagrees and hopes Mandela would focus on issues other than rugby. Mandela nevertheless moves forward with his own plans, one of which is to invite Francois to tea. Francois is asked how the Springboks will perform this year by an Afrikaner on the security team. Despite Francois's assurance that they would try their hardest, the Afrikaner concludes that they have no chance at all and informs the other members of the squad as such. Mandela and Francois had a conversation about motivation and inspiration inside of Mandela's office. He mentions a poem that helped him stay positive while he was detained, and Francois responds by saying he empathizes and citing a particular song the team performs before each game. Mandela makes the implication that a victory for their team in the cup may have significant consequences for South Africa by bringing together Afrikaners and the other tribes that make up South Africa without specifically asking Francois. 
Francois distributes copies of the South African national anthem to his staff and urges them to memorize it and sing it properly rather than mumbling over the lines as they formerly did in an effort to convey Mandela's message. The majority of the group scrunches up their copy and declares they are uninterested. Francois retracts his statement and admits it's voluntary. Mandela, though, commands them to take periodic vacations from their demanding training routine and travel to the townships to instruct the locals in rugby. The township youngsters initially surround Chester, McNeil Hendricks, the team's lone black player, but soon the entire squad is out there teaching a new generation rugby and instilling national pride, regardless of heritage. Francois encourages his players that change is a constant in life, the game, and their team is no exception. Mandela is discovered unconscious outside of his house. Mary keeps his calendar free so that he can watch rugby even though his doctor has prescribed complete bed rest to maintain his energy. Soon after the tournament begins, the Springboks shock everyone by defeating Australia. They continue to go for morning runs, and as they continue to win games, South African support for them grows and they continue to advance in the competition. After a game, Francois declares that they need a break, so they travel to the location of Mandela's imprisonment, Robben Island. Standing in what was formerly Mandela's cell, Francois is horrified to see how tiny it is, just covering his arm span, and that there is only room for a sheet on the floor to sleep on. The team observes the area where inmates crushed rocks as part of their labor while being held captive as the poem Mandela mentioned to Francois earlier is read aloud. The Springboks go for another early morning run on the day before the game. This time, they are joined by South Africans of both races who are rooting for their success. The security staff is anxious before the game because it will be the most exposed Mandela has been since entering office. While the rest of the security staff takes up positions within the stadium, additional sharpshooters take up positions on nearby roofs. The captain of a 747 declares complete responsibility for his activities to the co-captain, Grant Swanby, giving rise to speculation that he would launch a terrorist strike. The 747 flies low over the stadium with the words Go Springboks painted beneath it. Cheers emerge from the audience. 62,000 spectators have gathered at the stadium to watch the All Blacks of New Zealand, who are unbeaten, play the Springboks in the final game. Chester has been permitted to play in the game after his ailment has totally healed. NZ has so far largely shut out opposing teams in the event, the game that was closest was won by 20 points. Even though SA's chances are slim, they decide to give it their all. The score is deadlocked the entire time, and South Africa spends the most of the game catching up any time New Zealand scores a goal for three points. As the clock expires, South Africa manages to defeat New Zealand by a margin of three points. Winning by a score of 15-12. Following the trophy presentation, South Africans of all ancestries can be seen celebrating the Springboks in the streets of their country. Although it appears that Mandela's security team is having difficulty navigating the crowd, he claims that there is no urgency. In the views of both themselves and the rest of the world, their sense of national pride seem to have been somewhat restored, at least for the time being. The last reading of the Latin poem Invictus, which means unconquered, marks the conclusion of the movie. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.